Good morning, all. We're going to pick up where we left off on Monday, which was talking about the ovaries. And remember that the ovaries are the gonads of the female reproductive system. And the two kind of primary roles of the gonads are to first produce the gamete, which for the female reproductive system would be the egg or the ovum, and second to produce and secrete sex hormones. So when we were talking about the ovary, we were getting into more... Um, kind of structural presentation, we decided that the ovary kind of has two defined regions, although a lot of times they're kind of poorly defined. Uh, we have an outer cortex, as does a number of organs that we've talked to throughout the semester, and then they have an inner medulla. This inner medulla would um, be highly vascularized and innervated, and it's also where we are going to find um, the follicles. So when we think about these ovarian follicles, the most important thing to keep in mind is their kind of role is to contain uh, the immature egg. And as the follicle is going through development, uh, so is the oocyte um, until we go through um, the uh, actual ovulation and release that oocyte uh, towards the oviduct and then for it to carry on in hopes of fertilization. Um, so these follicles are uh, tiny sac-like structures um, that are embedded throughout the cortex and they are surrounded by both uh, follicle cells as well as granulosa cells. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these cells when we talk kind of more about the physiology component of it because they play a role again in the development and in the production and secretion of hormones. So there are several stages that a follicle will kind of transition through. Um, we're going to start off as primordial follicles. So with our primordial follicles from a structural standpoint, they are just a single single layer of follicle cells um, plus with the, the oocyte contained within. And then as we go through maturation processes, what we're going to see kind of add in addition to this is several layers of granulosa cells. So we transition from a kind of primary follicle over here and then we transition to a secondary follicle and then as we start to foam kind of this fluid filled interior this is what a more mature vesicular or tertiary follicle will look like. So when we get to the stage of a vesicular or tertiary follicle um, these are what we would consider fully mature follicles uh, this fluid-filled antrum that forms is kind of a nutrition source, but then also something that eventually leads to the rupture of this mature, maturing follicle, and that rupture um, is what allows the oocyte to be ejected, and this process is referred to as ovulation. So we're just kind of touching the surface right now because we're going to talk about ovulation as well as follicular development when we talk through the physiology phase um, on Monday. Okay, so from here, we're going to kind of start talking through the female duct system. So we have the gonad, the ovary, and the job of that is to produce the gamete. And then from there, that egg has to make its way to uh, the oviduct, um, also known as the uterine tube or the fallopian tube, um, where fertilization can take place by the sperm. Um, so the uterine tubes are about 10, 10 centimeters in length, um, or 4 inches, and their job is to receive the oocyte once it's been ovulated from the ovary. Now there are no direct attachment from the ovary to the uterine tube. So we'll discuss kind of structurally how the oocyte makes its way from um, the ovary after being injected and then is able to get into the uterine tube and carry on. Like I said, the uterine tube is the usual site of fertilization um, and it extends from just over the ovary, so kind of hovering around it, if you will, and to the supralateral region of the uterus. So we have some different regions of the uterine tube that we want to kind of be familiar with. So where the uterine tube is connected to the uterus is referred to as the isthmus. So if we look right here, kind of have the uterine tube hollowed out for us. Okay, 
and right at this area here where it's kind of connected towards the uterus a little bit constricted that is the isthmus right as we continue on right towards the ovary we then get to more of the distal end that kind of curves around the ovary and that's referred to as the ampulla and then the distal expansion that kind of opens up and almost looks like the funnel shape is referred to as the infundibulum and then the very kind of tips right of the infundibulum the most distal portion of that are these little kind of finger like projections and those are the ciliated fimbriae so come back come into the slide and we'll follow that oviduct all the way along and we see here as it starts to get a little bit more distended that is the ampulla we see here as it kind of creates more of like a funnel shape, that's the infundibulum. And then each of these projections, again, that are ciliated, that is the fimbriae. So part of what's going to happen here is as the oocyte is ejected, again, there's no direct contact, but the um, movement of the fimbriae and of the cilia kind of direct that oocyte towards um, the oviduct. So that's why you have that nice funnel shape opening is to kind of create a, a wider, broader opening in which the egg can kind of be encompassed as it leaves the ovary. And then we have the fimbriae as well as some peristalsis of the uterine tube to try to help um, move that egg into the tube and further along. So if we want to think about kind of the structural makeup of the tubes from a layer standpoint, um, like the lining of the uterine tube is ciliated uh, simple columnar epithelium. And so again, that makes sense to us, the simple columnar, because we need to be able to produce um, mucus and that requires us housing, right, some organelles in order to carry out that level of cellular activity and then the cilia to allow for some movement of the oocyte, as well as smooth muscle tissue. So then kind of next in line as far as the wall of the uterine tube would be smooth muscle, and the smooth muscle will contract, right, under um, kind of parasympathetic control, and it will allow for the movement of the oocyte via peristalsis. When we think about on the exterior, as far as what might be providing some support, right, and some structural integrity to the uterine tubes, first and foremost, it's going to be covered in peritoneum or dense connective tissue, and it will also be supported by portions of the broad ligament. So when we look over here on this end, the tube itself is kind of encased in a connective tissue. So you can think about that kind of being like that external layer, that tunica externa. And then it also is supported, right, via components of the broad ligament. So all of this area is creating some structural integrity. This is a nice view too, to look at kind of the funnel shape of the infundibulum and then the fimbriae or those finger-like projections. So then from there, right, we traveled down the oviduct and kind of our next stop along the female duct system is the uterus. Uh, the uterus is a hollow organ um, and it's a very um, muscular organ. So when we think about the uterus, we know that it has multiple layers and we'll talk through those layers. But um, the majority of it is the myometrium, which is a very thick muscular um, wall. The overall function of the uterus is to first receive uh, the fertilized egg um, and then kind of retain and nourish it. So this will be your site of implantation. We'll talk a little bit more about exactly where that happens. But as we start to go through um, embryonic uh, development, so that kind of transition from pre-embryonic to embryonic, has everything to do with the, the structure and the vascularization and the nutrients in the uterus. When we think about support and what provides it with some structural integrity, right, again, a portion of the broad ligament, more specifically, we refer to this area right here as the mesometrium, um, and then the round ligament. And so when we think about the round ligament, 
right? That's going to be a ligament that will kind of help secure the uterus to the anterior wall. So it'll be a thickening within, right, within that broad ligament. And it's seen best over here kind of as its own separate entity, okay? But that round ligament, a lot of times in the lab, we have to find the broad ligament and then tease out the round ligament, which will be a thickening. And really helps with that kind of anterior security. So we talked about a little bit of the suspensory ligament, suspending everything kind of laterally, the broad ligament kind of connecting everything and adding for some structural integrity, and now the round ligament providing some security to the anterior wall. When we think about regions of the uterus, right? So this is not layers of the uterus, this is regions kind of breaking it down into you know, different um, portions and, and we'll talk how about how these different portions relate to different roles that are played in the implantation process and the movement of sperm and things like that. So we start with the body. So the body is the major portion of the uterus. So all this portion here, right, is all of the body. Okay. And then the fundus is kind of the rounded or dome-shaped superior region of the uterus. As we approach it inferiorly, the uterus starts to narrow. So we refer to that narrowing as the isthmus of the uterus. And then we have a uh, kind of further narrowing in the space and a continued thickness in the muscular layer. And this narrowed neck that is still extremely muscular is referred to as the cervix. And the cervix will then be continuous um, with the vagina. And so we think about the cervix also including uh, the cervical canal, which is the open space within the cervix. So when we think about the cervical canal being an actual passageway, um, that allows uh, for it to be continuous again with the, the uterus and then to be continuous with the vagina. So we think about its ability to communicate with the uterine wall is through this opening, which we refer to as the internal os. And then its ability to communicate with the vagina is through this opening, which we refer to as the external os. Right. What we want to keep in mind is within the inner lining of the cervix, right, along the cervical canal, um, are mucus glands and the cervical mucus glands uh, secrete a mucus that is actually there to block sperm entry. And we'll talk about that and how the mucus presents itself and thickens based on hormonal control um, during the mid-cycle in order to prevent sperm from entering into the uterus and then eventually making their way to the oviduct. Now I kind of want to talk about the walls of the uterus, or the layers, if you will. Okay. The outermost layer of the uterus is referred to as the perimetrium, and this is the serous layer. So what we remember about serous layers is they'll have a layer of connective tissue and a layer of epithelial tissue that has the ability to secrete serous fluid, right, minimizing friction, um, as it kind of distends, right, contracts, things like that, and presses into uh, surrounding structures. We then have a very thick middle layer, referred to as the myometrium, and this is where we'll find the smooth muscle tissue. And then the endometrium, which is the lining, right, of the uterus. And this will be a mucosal lining, so it'll be composed of simple columnar epithelium, with the ability to produce and secrete mucus, it will also be reinforced by a thick lamina propria, which we know is where we'll have kind of a layer of dense irregular connective tissue adding to the structural integrity. So we look at the image here, and we can appreciate the lining, which is the endometrium. We then have a very thick layer of smooth muscle tissue, the myometrium, and the outer dense connective tissue, as well as a layer of simple squamous cells, um, allowing for serous fluid secretion, which is the perimetrium. So we wanna cue in a little bit into the endometrium. The endometrium is actually composed of two chief layers, 
um, the stratum functionalis and the stratum basalis. And when we think about these guys, they're really named kind of based first on their location, whether they're at the apical surface or the basal surface, and then based on kind of their primary role. So if we think about the stratum functionalis, right, that is all this region here. And your stratum functionalis is constantly changing in response to hormones, to estrogen and progesterone. Um, and so, yeah, obviously, the uterus is going to be preparing for implantation. So this area will thicken um, and become more lush, right? And highly vascularized, lots of nutrients waiting for implantation of the ovum, of the fertilized um, egg. And then if that doesn't happen, right, if there is no fertilization, there'll be a shift in hormone um, concentrations and we will actually shed our stratum functionalis. And that is what's taking place during menstruation is when a female is menstruating, um, they're actually losing that uh, outer or that inner layer, the most inner layer, the stratum functionalis. Okay? And at the, as we kind of shed that stratum functionalis, we have constant regeneration taking place um, in the stratum basalis. So that's what the stratum basalis is going to be called, is the new stratum functionalis after menstruation. And this is a layer that is not responding to um, estrogen or progesterone. So there are no real changes that will take place in the stratum basalis other than the changes that are necessary as it becomes the apical layer. And this is just try to kind of um, appreciate what's going on a little bit. So if we think about here, this is like my epithelium, right? This here is my lamina propria. So all of this is where we're going to have immense vascularization. Um, and then we have a little bit more of the smooth muscle fibers that are starting to present themselves here. But this is just trying to show you high, how highly vascularized the endometrium is. So then from the uterus, as we continue down the female duct system, we reach the vagina. And the vagina is a very thin walled tube and we'll talk about its kind of structural components in just a sec. But it's about eight to 10 centimeters in length or three to four inches. And its overall function is to act as um, the birth canal, right? Passageway for menstrual flow. And it also, would be the organ of copulation um, for the female reproductive system. So the organ of copulation for the male is the penis. The organ of copulation for the female is the vagina, who's designed to receive the, pe the penis um, during sexual intercourse in order to then receive the sperm and allow that sperm to make its way to the oviduct for fertilization. So kind of like more gross anatomy, um, orientation location wise, the vagina will extend between the bladder and the rectum, um, starting at the end of the cervix and then to the exterior. And as it's doing so, it will be running parallel to the urethra. Okay. So we kind of think about orienting ourselves to the reproductive system, which is fully colored here for us, and then kind of dueled the end of the digestive system, and then the urinary system. Just so you can kind of see the correlation between the uterus and kind of reference to the rectum and, and the sigmoid colon, if you will, and then the urinary bladder here. So if we go kind of body of the uterus through the cervix, now we're into the vagina. You can see how the vagina is kind of sitting in between the rectum and the uh, urinary bladder and the urethra traveling parallel to the urethra, okay? And then coming to its own um, external orifice, right? So we have an external urethral orifice and then we have a uh, vaginal orifice. Okay. So when we think about the composition of the vagina, um, we kind of break down the layers of the vaginal wall we first have a mucosa layer, so that is going to be composed of stratified squamous epithelium. We know that we have this tissue type in any 
uh, area in which it's under um, a lot of friction because it's highly um, layered and regenerates very rapidly so we can have cells kind of get sloughed off and then constantly um, uh, present with new cells. Internally it's kind of ridged, right? So it does present with rugae in the internal wall which just kind of again helps maximize some surface area and it forms kind of an incomplete partition near the vaginal orifice and this is the area which we refer to as the hymen. So if we come back kind of to this area here, right, the hymen would be this portion right here. So then as we travel exterior from the mucosa, we get to the muscularis layer and we'll find a thin layer of smooth muscle tissue here. And then when we get to the outer layer, we refer to this as the adventitia. And this is kind of more of a fibroelastic layer. And this is really interesting because it's dense, um, kind of dense connective tissue with an elastic connective tissue type quality. So it does have both collagen and elastic fibers present. Um, and it has them present not in, in kind of an irregular presentation. Um, not completely parallel to each other, but not completely sporadic either. It's more like you have a layer traveling one direction and then another layer of fibers that will kind of travel at a 90 degree angle to that. And part of that is to create structural integrity, but part of that is to also allow for distension so that the vaginal walls as a whole can stretch out and then resume their original shape. So all of that would be considered internal genitalia. Okay? So now we will talk about external genitalia. And in regards to female external genitalia, we also refer to this as the vulva. Okay? So all of these structures would be components of the vulva or of the external genitalia. So first and foremost, we start with the mons pubis. And the mons pubis is the fatty area here that kind of overlies the pubic symphysis. And the purpose here is to create a protection or a cushion to that area of the pubic symphysis. So it's subcutaneous tissue that's designed to absorb. Okay. From there, we then have skin folds that expand and we refer to these folds as our labia majora. And these um, are going to be hair covered folds so they will be covered in pubic hair just as the mons pubis is um, which kind of then delineates them from the labia minora which are going to be skin folds that lie within the labia majora and are um, oftentimes well always smooth and oftentimes kind of lubricated due to the release of secretions in the vestibule. So the vestibule is just the name given to this area that's contained within the um, labia minora. And kind of within the vestibule, we have some greater vestibular glands, right? And these greater vestibular glands, you can see the little ducts right here on each side, right? Are going to release mucus into the vestibule to kind of help lubricate that area. We'll see an increase in mucus during sexual arousal. If you go kind of more to the anterior part of the external genitalia, so anterior to the vestibule that I have highlighted with the red circle, that's where you'll find the clitoris. Um, and when we think about the clitoris, that it's going to be composed of both the glands. Um, just like you see the presentation in the penis, right? This is the female's um, erectile tissue. So during development at that six week mark, the anatomy of the external genitalia is very similar. And then the presence of testosterone allows for the continued development of the penis. But initially we have just these small areas of erectile tissue um, with that kind of overhanging skin for protection, so the prepuce, um, and then again, testosterone at that level of development would allow for female sex organs to develop differently than, or for male female for male sex organs to de to develop differently than females. 
And so we have the glands of the clitoris, that's kind of this exposed portion. And then we have kind of that skin fold or the hood underneath the glands, and that's referred to as the prepuce of the, clit uh, of the clitoris. So a lot of times kind of used interchangeably with the external genitalia is the word perineum. So we just want to make sure that we understand kind of the difference between the two. So when we think about perineum, perineum is really referring to this region between the pubic arch and the coccyx. So it's going to include a good majority of the external genitalia. Um, it's going to include kind of from the level of the vestibule um, and the clitoris, not, and then traveling more posterior, so all the way um, out past the uh, anus. So when we think about it, we think about it being kind of a diamond shape, starting at the pubic arch and then traveling back to the coccyx, but then also having kind of a lateral component. So both of the borders, um, both of the ischial tuberosities uh, kind of border it laterally. A lot of times we'll say, you know, this nerve is responsible for innervation to the perineum. And students are like, well, what is the perineum? And you say, well, it kind of includes the external genitalia. So like, so they start to, you want to use those interchangeably. But you'll notice the perineum doesn't take into account the mons pubis or the labia majora. So that kind of wraps up what we tend to think about and consider as far as female reproductive organs. Um, but uh, in addition to that, we also want to make sure that when we're talking about the female reproductive system that we're including the mammillary glands. Um, and your mammary glands are modified sweat glands um, that uh, present themselves in the breast. Um, and they are what's responsible for producing milk that will then nourish the newborn. Remember we talked about, you know, some of the huge differences between the, the male and the female are this the ongoing roles that the female reproductive system plays. So with the male, it's, it's the primary role is fertilization through production of, of sperm and making sure that sperm can get to their um, end goal along that long journey. And then with the female, it's beyond fertilization and it includes implantation and nourishment and development. And then even post-delivery, we still have, right, organs of the female reproductive uh, system, these mammary glands that are then producing milk and allowing for ongoing nourishment to the newborn. Um, so we just want to kind of understand the breakdown of our mammary glands. First and foremost, they're going to consist of lobes, right? So you can see that each of these would be a lobe. So it might present anywhere from 15 to 25 lobes. Um, and then within those lobes, we'll have multiple lobules, right? So if you look at each and every one of these little circles, those are all representative of a lobule. And we'll talk about kind of how those lobules contain the structures that actually produce the milk. If we think a little bit more about growth structure of the mammary glands, um, a lot of it is uh, thinking on the exterior. So being able to cue into the areola, which is the pigmented area of skin that surrounds the nipple. And when we kind of look internal in the nipple, we notice that the nipple is kind of a converging, right, of multiple little lactiferous ducts. And then those open, right, at the exterior of the nipple. Okay. So again, each lobule is going to contain multiple alveoli. And these alveoli are milk producing glands. And so once they have been triggered to uh, secrete or to produce and then secrete the milk. The milk will then travel down a lactiferous duct, right, and then into lactiferous sinuses, right, and from there we will enter at the openings of lactif at the lactiferous ducts um, and exit th through the, the nipple, which is on the exterior. Um, something to keep in mind is that 
for the most part, the, the structure of the mammary gland is the same across all females as far as the presentation and the number of lobules, or of lobes, excuse me. Um, but re really plays the, the biggest role in the differences in breast size is the amount of adipose tissue, right, that is contained within the um, breast and supporting and providing uh, nutrients and cushioning and protection to the mammary glands. All right, guys, so that kind of wraps up our female reproductive anatomy. Um, kind of went through that you know, a bit superficial, knowing that when we go into the physiology, that's when we're going to break down a little bit more of the cell types and talk about their specific roles. And then we'll be talking about hormone regulation. Um, and we'll dive a little bit more into the fertilization and the implantation processes when we transition into human development later next week.